During enslavement, there was not time for people to care about their mental health. Our ancestors were not considered human. So if you're not considered human, if you're considered like a machine, you don't really need to do anything but work all day. So other things about your life that other people would recognize and respect in their own lives, they don't respect those things in you. Hi there. Welcome to Students of Mind, the mental health podcast made by Curious Minds for Curious Minds. On this podcast, we the hosts are just like you, eager to learn more about the mind. Here we learn with you and provide you with clear, concise information backed up by real experts about all things mental health. My name is Jade. And my name is Amina, Jade's mom. Today, as we continue our conversations about Black mental health, we're joined by therapist Shayla Tumbling to explore the mental health experiences of Black women. So today's guest is Shayla D. Tumbling. She is a therapist and sexuality and emotional empowerment coach and educator. She describes herself as compassion-centered, trauma-informed, integrative, holistic, and sex-positive. Shayla's work centers around empowering and providing safe spaces for Black women to heal. Welcome, Shayla, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. (laughs) Yeah, I'm excited to have you. Um, Before we get into the questions, can you tell us a little more about yourself and the work that you do? Yes. So I'm originally from Mississippi, uh, born and raised, a small town in Mississippi. I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been in Atlanta for about five years now. I'm actually about to move back to Mississippi to finish my doctorate degree. So I was... Working on my doctorate, 2009, I moved to Atlanta like 2013 or 14 and took a break because I've been on hiatus and was in an interesting place in completing that. But last year, I decided to go back and decided to finish. So I actually got assigned an internship position at my old alma mater, Mississippi State University. So I'll be going back there and doing therapy with students uh, next year in the completion of my degree. Um It's kind of like me in a nutshell. I've been in school all my life. (laughs) In school, um, I enjoy school. I enjoy learning. I'm always taking classes. Let's see, I love to travel. And um, in the midst of getting my doctorate, I've been integrating other parts of myself. So I've been connecting more to a spiritual aspect of myself, metaphysical, and then the sexuality piece, which I've incorporated into my work. So all that's kind of grown out of this journey that initially just began as doing like traditional psychotherapy. Great. Um, So today's conversation is really just to kind of start a larger conversation about Black women's experience with our mental health. Mm -hmm. It's a huge topic and there's so much that goes into it. And I know that we're not going to be able to cover everything today. So I just kind of want to cover some like baseline stuff um, so our listeners can start to build their knowledge about how Black women go through life. So my first question, which is a broad question, but I was just wondering if you could summarize or give like a view of what mental health looks like in Black women, what their experience with mental health is like and why it is that way? When I speak about Black women, I also like to, I guess, give a disclaimer for people about the aspects of my identity because I recognize that we are not a homogenous group. And so I like to say, you know, I speak from my experiences being my experience and a lot of my experiences working with Black women who are born in America. I think that's really important to recognize that, of course, there are going to be nuances to different cultures, um, even within those of us born in America, born in different regions of America. So the parts of my identity that stand out when I think about that are like, I identify as a cisgender Black woman. I said born and raised in the South, like the deep South. Mississippi is different. (laughs) Um, All the Southern states are different, but um, my experience being there and being from there is a lot different than experience living in other Southern states. So all those things are important to consider. And when I think about the mental health of Black women, and 
I guess what that looks like. A lot of times I feel like um, because just coming from my personal foundation of being a Southerner and uh, being in what they call the Bible Belt, a lot of times my experience has been people don't talk about their mental health a lot, especially Black women. There are stereotypes that go along with every ethnicity, every gender, all of that. And Black women have quite a few themselves. So being strong, being able to take on anything, dealing with things and maybe not having a safe place are people that can help support you through that. You know, some Black women are able to have circles, maybe of friends and stuff that they're able to connect with. And that's important. But then also depending on the way they were taught to deal with or to express or to manage their mental health, that's going to impact the way that they do it in their lives. So I was raised by my maternal grandmother. So I grew up with my mother's side of the family, not my father's side. And my my mother is a baby of 12. And so she, while she was in my life, my grandmother raised me for the majority of my life. And so that experience growing up with a Southern Black grandmother in the country who was born like in the 20s. So she lived through the Great Depression. She also had experiences in her life. She was raised by a woman who wasn't her birth mother, a woman who was biracial, white and indigenous American. And that woman experienced trauma where she witnessed her own mother, who was an indigenous woman, being uh, brutalized by her father. He would abuse her. Her white father would abuse her indigenous mother. And as a child, she saw that. And this is the woman who raised my grandmother. So she wasn't blood related to us, but she was my grandmother's midwife. She was the woman who delivered my grandmother. My grandmother's mother, my grandmother was copper tone. My grandmother's mother did not want her because my grandmother was too dark skinned. So the rest of the people in my grandmother's family, like all the uncles and stuff I met growing up, my great uncles, I never considered them this way until I met other people outside of my family, friends and stuff. They'd be like, is your uncle white? And I was like, no, and don't don't ever say that to him because his experiences with white people growing up in the South of Mississippi were very violent and he would be very offended by that. But I never realized, you know, how fair skinned he was. And so those are just some experiences in my own family. And this is the woman who raised me. She's a very strong woman. She's a very sweet woman, Um, quiet in some senses, but in some senses not petite in stature. And she was also a very deeply religious woman, very deeply in the church. So all of those things play into the experiences that just in my own life I saw with Black women around their mental health. There wasn't a lot of talk about, you know, taking care of your mental health outside of praying to God um, about things to support you in managing what might be going on. But there was not a lot of talk at all about maybe being depressed or being sad or feeling tired or any of those types of things. There weren't conversations. And it wasn't until I moved into when I went to school and started studying mental health and being in spaces where I was doing therapy with people, that there were more experiences for people to talk about those. And oftentimes when I would have Black people, Black women come into my office and I'd be doing work with them, sometimes depending on where they were from, their cultural background and everything like that. But a lot of times it would be their first time even looking for uh, and engaging in therapy. You know, like, oh, this is different for me. I don't really know what to say or what to do. And you know that that's not necessarily unusual for anyone. A lot of people from different backgrounds, it might not be a common experience to go to therapy. But I noticed with a lot of my Black female clients, that definitely was not something they did, especially with some of the deeper challenges they had in their lives. Uh, It was very hard for them. They didn't have spaces where they could speak with someone and do work around those things. So as far as the people that you see in your practice, And when Black women finally get to therapy, are they able to embrace the safe space that you create? Do they take several sessions to buy into it? What is it like to actually counsel a Black woman? Mm. So I've had different experiences. I've also worked with women in different settings. So I've done therapy with Black women in private practice, and I've done therapy with Black women in college counseling centers. So coming in and connecting, it is definitely a thing that in my experience with the clients that I've had, 
we, we've been able to connect pretty much right off the bat. And some clients that I've worked with that have come in have been older professional women. So, you know, out of college, maybe in their 30s, 40s, um, married with children. And a lot of the themes that I've seen, because I one of the things I do believe in is that we often attract uh, certain people and energy into our lives. So some of the themes I've seen for the Black women that have come in to see me are they're in a place in their life where like their careers together are financially they're in a good space, but they're beginning to question aspects of their identity. Like, who am I outside of being a mother? Who am I outside of being a wife? They might have teenagers or they might have kids newly in college. Like, so I've been in this role of a mother for 15, 20 years. I've been a wife, been with my partner for like 10, 15 years. Like, and now I'm beginning to question, like, who am I outside of this? Like, who am I? And those women and some of my experiences working with them, they come in and they're open and they're ready to, to begin to explore that. Sometimes with some of the things going on in their lives, some of them are also questioning their relationships. So it's kind of like, I've been with my partner this long and now I'm wondering, you know, because there's some things with their personality, my partner's personality, and I'm not really certain if I want to continue on this path. And again, it ties back into like, who am I outside of all these things? And is this something that's going to be in this next chapter in my life? And so with those women, we've been able to do some work together. And then sometimes we hit a block are a point where some things come up and they may not come back right away. And unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity to do like that additional session so I can check in. And I know life happens. Life happens to all of us. You know, it's happening now with everything going on. And it could possibly be that. And it could possibly be the fact that they've begun to do this work and it's stirring things up inside of them. So it may look like life is happening, but it may actually be this new stuff that's coming up inside of me, I'm really not ready to push past that or to to go go deeper into that. And that's perfectly fine and perfectly understandable because just my understanding and the way that we work and shift and move and everything like that, that we're going to reach plateaus and then we'll come back to something once again when we have the resources that we need internally and externally to be able to to tackle that next level in our lives. So... um, A supervisor once taught me, we are just stepping into someone's journey when they come to do work with us. And we don't know how much time we might have one session with them. We might have, you know, 10, 15, 20 sessions with them, but we work to be as present with them and to offer them everything we can in those moments, because it might be the only time that we have with them. And, you know, they'll take whatever we create together and that'll be a part of their journey moving forward. So those are some of my experiences with with women in private practice and then working with college students, uh, a lot of times with young Black female college students, it's a lot of different stuff. Sometimes they come in and they're struggling in school, you know, grades and stuff like that. They've had amazing grades and then they hit like something. And then when we begin speaking, a lot of times they have some unresolved trauma, especially from childhood. So experiences of abuse, sexual assault, those types of things. And they are coming up because there might have been something or there's something that had triggered that since they've been in school. You know, or they find themselves, I've had some college, some of my black female college students are like, yeah, like I got really heavy into drinking and, you know, college kids are going to drink. They're going to experiment with things, but they realize for themselves, I've been doing this and it is a bit more detrimental. It's, a, it's outside of just recreational, but it's really impacting my life in a negative way. Um, and usually it, In my experience with the young women I've worked with, it has been connected to some unresolved trauma, like I said, you know, and being in a new space and the College Counseling Center is free for students at the universities I've worked at. So they are able to connect to that resource and they might hear like a friend had gone for like depression or anxiety or something. And so they go and they're like, I'm going to try it out. So they'll come, they'll come and they'll do their sessions there. And that's been a pretty good experience with them. So, so it's varied for me in the settings that I've been in working with women. Um, do you um, only see women? So when I talk about my work, because I do therapy and I'm trained in therapy, but what I've really been doing over the past several years is working on crafting my brand and moving more into the coaching space and moving more into what I call the healing facilitator space. And so in doing that work, because I'm particularly interested and in centered around Black women's sexuality and emotional empowerment, 
And so in doing that work, I tell people all the time when I'm speaking or whatnot, I said, so I center Black women in my work, but I will work with whoever resonates with me. And so in saying things like that, there are people who are going to, when they hear me speak, they resonate with me, they resonate with my energy, and they're like, I want to work with you. But they do know that my advertising, my put when I'm out and you see me talking, it's typically going to be about Black women, our sexuality, and our emotional health. But I've worked with people of all genders. I've worked with people of multiple ethnicities. So I'm open. But I, I say it like that. I say I center Black women in the work that I do. And if you resonate with me, we can work together. If you don't identify as a Black woman, that's fine. So I am in therapy. I've been in therapy for years. I, my first therapist was when I was like 12, but I found the first therapist that's actually been helpful last year. Mm -hmm. And she's white, but all of the work that I've done with her so far has been great. And I'm just wondering what your opinion is on like, as a black woman, who we should be seeking out as our therapists should we be looking for other black women or just black therapists in general do you have any input on that mm -hmm. so I think it's very important for people to find a therapist that is a good fit for them so you might have heard that that phrase used before a good fit Kind of like with anything in life, if you're looking for a job, if you're looking for a part like a romantic partner, you want to find someone who's a good fit for you. All therapists are not created equal. And I am not necessarily of the mindset that we have to work with a therapist that looks like us, that we have to work with, you know, Black female therapists or Black therapists if that's how we identify. I do think it's important for people of color and for Black people to find therapists who are more than culturally competent because you want to work with a therapist who is going to be well aware of the environment that we live in, an environment uh, systems that are built on systemic racism and anti-Blackness um, and all the different isms and who have done their work and are actively doing their work around deconstructing those things inside of themselves. So... I believe that no matter how you identify, if you're born and raised in this system and maybe pretty much all over the world, because colonization happened much all over the world, particularly here in this system for people who identify as white, I think their work is a bit different. And if they're not actively doing their work to recognize like, oh, I have privilege. Oh, this system, this entire system that exists in this world is built to be anti-Black and it's built to be against people of color and all those different things. There's a lot of internal work they need to do. There are many great white therapists out there and, you know, people who are not therapists that are white who are actively doing their work. They recognize like, oh, these things have insidiously been put inside of me. I've been socialized to believe and move in the world this way. And they're doing the work all the time to deconstruct those things. I even think like, as Black people, as people of color, we also can hold some of those internalized biases because we're all raised in the system to not want to honor and to not want to um, support or see like the goodness and the balance and the positive in Blackness, in feminineness, in, you know, able-bodiedness or, or non-able-bodiedness, any of that, like, we're just taught to view things from a very centric way that's not supportive of everyone, of every type of ability and gender and all of that in our society. So, so long answer short, <laughs> as long as your therapist is a good fit for you and there's someone, you know, if you're working with a therapist, especially if there's someone white who's been doing that work, are they like choosing to do that work? Like, yeah, I want to learn more about anti-racism. Yeah, I want to learn more about anti-oppression to make sure I'm not unconsciously doing those things when working with my clients and causing more damage 
possibly when working with them. Because if my client comes and says, hey, if you're working with a white male therapist and you have a, a someone who identifies as feminine and they say, hey, I've experienced a lot of sexism from you know, people, particularly like males are the masculine in my life. And they're like, are you sure that's what it is? Maybe it's not that maybe, or if you're a person of color and you're like, you know, I think maybe the workplace I work in that they are, you know, that they are racist and they have racist ideals and stuff. And are you sure? Maybe you're not. You want someone who's going to be aware and they're going to be able to um, support you and understand like, yeah, it's a system and it's real and what you're experiencing is real. So there are nuances to finding out who's a good fit for you. You know, uh, some people specialize in things, right? So you might want to, if you're dealing with, say, if I'm dealing with anxiety, I'm probably going to seek out someone who is a specialist in anxiety. And then I'm going to want to ask them questions about how they work with their clients and how um, successful their clients have been in working to manage their anxiety. Uh, and maybe some other things like for me personally to see if that person might be a good fit for me. But everyone's not a good fit for everyone. Like I said, we are all created differently. We all go to different trainings and have different um, supervision styles and supervisors who have helped groom us to be therapists. So it's important, I think, for people when they're seeking mental health professionals to go in and to ask questions and to know what they're looking for, for someone to support them. And if it doesn't feel like a good fit at some point, it's okay to be like, hey, you know, I think maybe I want to seek um Therapy somewhere else. Somewhere else. This is not a good fit for me. It's not helping me to move in the direction I want to move in. Yeah, your answer seems very much aligned with other opinions I've heard about that. People just emphasize that as a black person, you need to make sure you're finding someone that's culturally competent or informed. And I know one thing that is very important for therapists to acknowledge when they're treating Black patients is the intergenerational trauma aspect of our experience. And I feel like a lot of people don't even know what that is. Um, I am so lucky to have a therapist who brought this up to me and started kind of like exploring this with me. So could you explain what intergenerational trauma is? And I know that you say that you're, you make sure that you're trauma informed and you talk about how a lot of the college students you dealt with had some like unresolved trauma. So can you like define intergenerational trauma and how that's different than trauma in general? Mm Mm-hmm. So when we think about trauma in general, some people in the trauma field, they talk about what they would call like a big T trauma and then like little T traumas. So big T traumas are often, I think, when when the trauma field was growing and expanding and people typically thought about trauma, one of the groups they would think about were uh, like veterans, war veterans. And so you go to war. That's a that can be a very traumatic experience. You're over there. You might have to kill people. You might see people around you getting killed. You're in a war zone, and so that experience being a very traumatic experience. Or if you're in a car accident, and see it's a single event. It's a car accident, and then you develop trauma from that experience, right? And then so they talk about. Little T traumas also, and they talk about, it could be, um, we think about developmental trauma. It could be things that have happened to you from a young age. Say if you were a victim of childhood uh, sexual abuse, uh, someone in your life when you were little was abusing you sexually. It doesn't have to be sexual abuse. It could be emotional abuse. It could be neglect, those types of things. That stuff was happening to you over a period of time. It wasn't just one single event. It continued to happen across your developmental stages, right? And so all those different things are impacting you in multiple ways, impacts you physically, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, those traumas are impacting you and they are continuously, you're not, you're not being able to work on them. You're not receiving support around them. So they're continuously building and building and building. You adjust because as humans, we're resilient and you're functioning, but you're probably not functioning at your highest, best capacity you could. You don't know, because that's all you've ever experienced. Maybe you grew up with someone who de- deals with alcoholism, or maybe you grew up with, you know, siblings who were bullying you to to an extent 
that was just very traumatic. And you learn how to adjust, you learn how to grow thicker skin or whatever, right? And you you go and move into the world and you begin interacting with people. So intergenerational trauma in some fields of study, it's called transgenerational trauma. You might hear it called cultural cultural trauma. You might hear it called historical trauma. But this is trauma that happens and it's passed along throughout generations. So the story I told you earlier when I was speaking about my maternal grandmother and saying that the woman who raised her had experienced um, trauma watching her father, her birth father, do horrific things to her birth mother. So I didn't grow up knowing this woman. She was around um, my aunts. So she was my, like my great grandmother, technically, but I didn't grow up knowing her. And I don't know if my mother, how much my mother remembers about her. But say this woman, let's just say, in that experience of watching her father interact that way with her mother, say that she developed a mistrust of men, right? And she's like, can't trust any men because they're going to do these horrible things to you, like my father did to my mother. And so in her interaction with my grandmother and raising her, she teaches my grandmother that maybe in the way that she sees her interacting with men, maybe in the things she says about men, she might blatantly say, can't trust men. You can never trust them. They, they're going to do horrible things to you. Right. So my grandmother goes, she gets married. She has children. You know, she's in love or she gets married because that's what people do. Right. They get married and they have children. And as she's raising her daughters, maybe she, you know, she's carrying a hose that belief. And she tells her daughters, you can never trust men. They're not any good. You don't know what they will do to you. You know, so her daughters are the way that she interacts with her husband. They might see like, oh, mom does this stuff and she doesn't consult with him or she does this stuff and she always says negative things to him. You know, whatever it is, it could be verbally, um, it could be very direct or it could be very subtle, but we're picking up on everything in our environment at all times. Direct are um, subtle things. We pick up on those. I also personally believe that we pick up energetically and spiritually too. So all those things, we were soaking in all that stuff. And then her daughters go out, they get married, they have that same belief. They're not aware, they're not consciously aware of it, but you know, they have boyfriends, they're dating, and then their relationships is always something that's going on. And then one day, uh, somebody, you know, it's like, I'm tired. Every time I have a relationship, then this doesn't work. And then that relationship, um, it's, it's just horrible. And I just can't figure anything out. They decide to go talk to a professional. They sit down, they talk about their experiences and the professional might be like, hey, so what happened? Where do you think you got those beliefs from? They're like, what do you mean? Well, what do you believe about men? Well, men are horrible. They're going to do horrible things to you. They can't be trusted. And then the person's, the therapist repeats that back. And the person's like, well, I didn't, I didn't say that. Well, yeah, well, in the way that you describe this to me, in the way that this, you describe this to me, it sounds like you have a mistrust of men. And the person's like, oh my gosh, I wonder where that came from. Like maybe my mother never direct, she would say little things to my father, but I don't know. And that wasn't necessarily that woman's personal experience. I mean, she had those experiences, but how much of her having those experiences also came from just a subtle transmission of that belief from her mother to her and from her mother's mother to her. Um, so intergenerational trauma is like that. On a larger scale, it can be poverty. You can see families who, generation after generation, the family's in poverty. And, you know, we look at things that happen in society and we say, oh, well, that's just, you know, some people are born in poverty and they live in poverty and some people aren't. It is all a part of a system and all the things, all these things tie in that we've been talking about, so systemic oppression, racism, all that type of stuff. And so financial management can be passed along throughout generations your emotional health and how you manage that can be passed along throughout generations. Your mental health and how you manage that can be passed along throughout generations. I particularly like to look at sexuality and emotional empowerment. So your beliefs around sexuality can be passed along throughout generations around the way that you view sexuality and how you engage in your sexuality and what that means to be sexually expressive or to not be sexually expressive, you know, and a lot of times we're not aware that the socialization we receive from our environment and our families, 
those being blood families and or those being the families that have helped to raise us that might not be blood families, how that information is passed along and how we integrate that into who we are. So that's that's my understanding and how I teach about intergenerational trauma. Um yeah, that that's that's a lot to unpack. Um and I know we're in a bit of a time crunch. Um but there's just one more question that I really want to make sure that we touch on that kind of uh plays into this like intergenerational aspect of like things being passed down. As you know, as black women, there's always been this idea of like we have to be extremely strong all the time and we have to hold all of our stuff together and we have to hold everyone else's stuff together so I'm wondering if you have any ideas of like where that idea came from um I know like for me I just feel like that's just how it is and like as long as I've been alive as long as I can remember just that idea that as a black woman I need to be stronger and strive to be stronger than everyone else because I have to hold it together not just for me but for everyone else um so where does this come from and how is this affecting our mental health I think there is some truth in it the truth in the strength of black women and in our ability to to hold and manage and carry things I do think that it is detrimental also A lot of the things that I look at, I look at the impact of enslavement and the impact of colonization. And so I believe, I believe that from like the institution of enslavement, particularly here in the, in America, like that, that institution really played a very strong role in Black women having to hold and manage everything, having to be the protectors of themselves as much as they could and of their children and their families as much as they could. Not being able to show any weakness or vulnerability because there wasn't really time. Like during enslavement, there was not time for people to care about their mental health. They weren't considered human, right? Our ancestors were not considered human. So if you're not considered human, if you're considered like a machine, you don't really need to do anything but work all day, nonstop. And so other things about you and your life that other people would recognize and they would uh, respect like they would in their own lives, they don't respect those things in you. And so I think that was partially birthed out of that experience of having to, again, be resilient and figure out how can we survive this? And so what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to figure out how I can hold it all together, how I can disconnect from my feelings and emotions as much as possible, because I don't have the time and space to to think about these things. I have to tuck it away somewhere and I just have to disassociate and do this work that I have to do because I don't want to get killed. I don't want my family members to get killed. You know, I don't want to be assaulted or raped and none of that matter because those things still happen. Right. So I think just the sheer viciousness and the brutality of that period of enslavement was a part of the birthing of that part of Black women being strong. I think Black women have always been strong and people recognize that in us. And then having to figure out how do I manage and maneuver during this time when anything I do and say I could breathe the wrong the wrong way and that could be the end of my life or to hurt me even more be the end of my children's life or someone's life who I really care about. So I think it came out of that out of that period and that time. Yeah. I that's you know just hearing you talk about that and thinking about what our ancestors went through that just brings like a a really heavy feeling in my chest. And, you know, just thinking about how no wonder we are experiencing like the emotional strife that we're feeling. We were for hundreds of years, you said, you know, we were dissociating because if we didn't, then we would get killed. (laughs) So that amount of anxiety 
and fear that we were experiencing on a daily basis for hundreds of years. And still now, no wonder Black women are, you know, very vulnerable for mental illnesses and bear the brunt of a lot of discrimination and are expected to be able to be resilient and not show any tears or lapse in resilience um, as we're going through things. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. I feel like the stuff we did talk about was really valuable. So thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Students of Mind. Please be sure to check the description to see where you can follow Shayla and see her work. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave a review. Otherwise, I will see you next episode.